5.5. This is a big, big section for us going forward. The definite integral and the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, it's the culmination of the chapter, no less. And we've got a lot to say here in this section. So let's settle in. How's this going to begin? Uh, okay, well, if you recall, it was all about this question right here. Some given function f of x, we want a quick way to find the exact area between f of x and the x-axis from x equals a to x equals b. In 5.4, we learned a way to get an approximation for that, and we could get more, you know, we could get uh, more accurate or less accurate. Um, but now we're going to get it exactly, and it will be a faster approach. And we're, of course, we're going to connect it with antiderivatives and the indefinite integral. Okay, so what did we do? In 5.4, just a, a quick visual recap here. Um, so imagine, you know, you've got that function. You want to approximate the area between A and B. I divided this up into four rectangles, and I made them left rectangles. doesn't really matter for my drawing right here. Um, what's important is I said, hey, there are n subintervals, right? One, two, three, four rectangles. Here's the question. How many subintervals would we need to get that area exactly? And I think part of the discussion back in 5.4 was the more intervals you have, the better. Right? So we did an example where, you know, in the first part, part A, we had four subintervals and I, I and they were left. But in part B we had eight subintervals. And we could see, yeah, just visually, I mean, if you make eight rectangles instead of four, the errors are going to get smaller. Of course, why stop at eight? I mean, you could have a hundred rectangles or a thousand rectangles. How many rectangles or subintervals to get the area exactly? Well, if the more you have is always better, and it is, then you want infinitely many subintervals, infinite subintervals. If you want to get it exactly, then all of those little bits that hang off the end need to disappear completely. So that'll happen uh, with, in theory, an infinite number of rectangles, right? So our number of subintervals sub intervals goes to infinity. Hmm, okay, okay. Well, that raises um, another question. We always need the width of each rectangle, right? It's the height times the width to get the area of each one. Well, if there's infinitely many, what's the width of each rectangle, right? The more rectangles you pack in there, the smaller their width, right? Well, if there's infinitely many, what's the width? And here's the thing. We can't say that it's zero. It is shrinking, but it's not zero. We're going to call it by the word infinitesimal. So it's like infinity, but okay, infinitesimal. It's infinitely tiny. And I just said the width is approaching zero. It never gets to zero, but it is approaching zero as n approaches infinity. Mm, okay. Where is this going? We're going to define the definite integral. And I'll give you the notation for it. The definite integral is defined to be exactly what we've been asking this whole time. It's the exact area between f of x and the x-axis from x equals a to x equals b. And here's the notation for it. Some of this is going to look familiar. I'm going to point out to some parts, but some of it's new. So we have the integral sign, okay? We have f of x, we have the dx on the end. All right, just like an indefinite integral, but what makes this definite, we're gonna put a number down here and a number up here, and that's the a and the b. 
where we start and where we stop. Now when we saw the notation for the indefinite integral, it was just out of nowhere, right? It didn't make sense, and I kind of promised that it would make sense later. So let's let's try and do that now. What does the f of x in this represent? Think about the rectangles. It represents the height, right? The function is how tall your rectangle is at that particular moment, yeah? The dx even has meaning. It's the width. Let me show you all this. It's the width, the height times the width. That's the infinitesimal. That's the width that is approaching zero. It's an infinitely small change in the x value. Okay. Even the more familiar, you know, where we've seen it in the past, dy over dx, that's the change in y divided by the change in x. It's the slope. It's the slope of the tangent line, the derivative, right? Except we didn't mention it then because it would have been too much. But it's this infinitely small change in y, this infinitely small little vertical change, right? In proportion to the infinitely small little change horizontally infinitely small vertical change in proportion to infinitely small horizontal change creates your slope. Okay, why does it have to be infinitesimal? Because your curve is constantly moving. So we need, I think I want to, anyway, I'm getting too deep into this part, right? But we, we take this tiny little shift and then boom, we got the tangent line. Okay, so really my main point is, it's a height times a width. That's the area of a tiny, super tiny, thin little rectangle, okay? And we're gonna pack infinitely many of them in there. Their width is almost nothing. They do have a height, it's the function. So then what is this symbol all about? If that tells us the area of one of these tiny little rectangles, what is this telling us to do? Okay, so I told you that symbol for integral is a stretched out letter S. Why the letter S? It stands for a sum. It means we're going to take the sum of all infinitely many rectangles and the A and the B, starting at A, ending at B. Pack infinitely many rectangles between A and B and then add all of their areas up. And how does the area? Height times width. <laughs> that is pretty cool. On that note, uh, I just have this to say. A and B, uh, you'll typically hear them referred to as the limits of integration. The limits because they are where you begin and end. So they're like the, the boundaries. That's what we mean by limits here. Okay, so begin... Your rectangles at A, stop them at B, pack infinitely many in there, and add them all up. Add all the areas. Okay. We're ready. Now, this is coming back to back. This is, this is hardcore. The fundamental theorem of calculus. The fundamental theorem of calculus links the idea of the definite integral with the idea of the derivative. Okay, it, it, it marries the two together, and it shows they're actually opposites. Okay, so here's what's going on. My definite integral, and you would read this if you were to say it out loud, the definite integral from A to B of f of x dx. It's equal to, and kind of go with the notation here, I, I write capital F of x. That's the antiderivative. So... That, that integral sign, still like before, it means we perform the antiderivative on lowercase f, and I'm just going to say that that antiderivative is, I'm representing it with capital F of x. This is pretty common in calculus uh, textbooks and calculus work. Okay, so when I take the antiderivative, I get capital F of x.
So where did the A and the B come in? Okay, I'm going to then draw this vertical line and put the A at the bottom and the B on top. And what that does is it means in the next step, I'm going to evaluate from A to B. How do I evaluate from A to B? Well, you see it right here. I plug the B in first, I subtract, and then I plug the A in to the antiderivative. So in words here on the page, better than spoken, find the antiderivative of f of x, then evaluate from A to B. OK. Some of this is kind of light on the, the video. Let's see this in action. I guess I've got my first example on the next page. All right, here we are. Evaluate the definite integral. You know what? We saw this same thing back in 5.4. Um, you remember using the function x squared plus 1, and we looked at it starting at 0, ending at 8. And we looked at uh, left rectangles, and then in part b, we looked at right rectangles. Hey, now we're going to look at this function. We're going to get the area exactly. OK, so we would read this, the definite integral from 0 to 8 of x squared plus 1 dx. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the antiderivative here. What's the antiderivative of x squared? And I'll just show you the whole thing. Well, it had to come from x to the third, and we would need the 1 third here, so that when we took the derivative, it got back to this. The antiderivative of 1 would have just been x. Then we'll draw that line from 0 to 8. What from there? OK, I'm going to plug in the 8 to both of them, subtract, and then I'm going to plug in the 0, just like this. Plug in the 8, subtract, plug in the 0. Now we get kind of lucky. Um, I mean, at this point, we just need to crunch this number, and, and we got it. Um, we get lucky that the zeros are, are just nothing. It's all about this in this problem. So 1 third times 8 to the third plus 8 turns out to be, and I wrote it as the fraction here, uh, 5 36 over 3. But of course, I wanted to compare this number to the values that we got back in 5.4 when we did the approximations. So you could also think of it uh, you know, that's the same as 178 and 2 thirds. And if you remember in 10.4, 10.4, 5 uh, we found that function from 0 to 8 um, left rectangles, 4 left rectangles, it turned out to be 120, far below the actual value. We did it with right rectangles, eight right rectangles, turned out to be 212, a little bit high. We knew the answer was somewhere in between, and it makes sense that the actual area is a little bit closer to the one with eight subintervals, because that's going to be more accurate. But yeah, it is between, and hey, that's what we are looking for the whole time. That's the exact area for that function between zero and eight. Pretty awesome. All right comes out so nice too it's this curved area hey it's just 178 and two-thirds that's all all right we're going to stop this video here we got lots more examples coming up